Half a year had passed since the tournament at a Cree had brought barons from across the lands of Western Christendom together in the name of a new crusade. Such a mission required the coordination of many key players, each serving a vital role in shaping plans and building a force capable of enacting them. With so many strong personalities, fierce tempers, and difficult tasks before each of them, tensions were high whenever the Crusader Baron came together at Sassons. The success of their mission depended not only on their ability to rally troops and tackle logistical challenges, but on Theobald managing to keep these tensions from boiling over. He's already forged peace with John and Legault, and the succession stands confirmed. There shall be no war. He also broke a peace with me at Peron, yet it changes nothing. Philip will not rest until he shatters the Angevin dynasty. Must we entertain treachery, contend with marauding mercenaries, and endure countless sieges? Is that the course you propose? Harken, harken, venerable lords. What the king does with his ambitions is none of our concern. Our vows grant us immunity, and we now tread a higher path. Our duty is to set our own houses in order and ride forth to cleanse ourselves of sin, not to amass it further. Now, let us review the houses that have joined the cause and tally up our forces. Lord Baldwin, what news from the Flemish? My authority over Hainaut, Flanders, Hesden, Namor, and most of Artois is unquestioned and a multitude of knights have already taken the cross. Hugh of Saint Paul, Pierre of Amiens, Jean of Nessel, Rainier of Trit are with us and the bishops of Beauvais, Tournac, Noyon, and Lone will surely follow. Much of the nearby lands are also held by you, venerable gentlemen. Bertil by Theobald, Clermont by Louis, and Boulogne by Reynard. However, we must also address the less promising developments. Philip has a firm grip over Valois and Vermandois, and Raoul of Il has shifted his allegiance from the Angevins to him. His lands, coupled with those of Ponteo and Almale, will be the first to bear the brunt of this war, so we should not anticipate assistance from those regions. On the topic of nobles who will surely refuse the call, we should mention the king's cousin, Robert of Dru and his lapdog Ungron, who controls Suse, Marley, and Rousse. I feel obliged to remind you that all of our grace's lands are under an interdict. Even bereft of religious support, our quest sounds as a sole chance for many to seek redemption. Ah, my report will be rather brief. My brother-in-law, Walter Vaven, he is with us and I have received pledges from numerous knights in Chartres, Chateaudun, and Orléans. My fiefs may not have the numbers such as those of the Flemish, but each of my men fights with the strength of a dozen Sassens. I have also sought audience with our uncle, King John, to ascertain if he would lend us any support, even if only in the form of coin. Champagne stands steadfastly by its liege and the holy mission. Currently, our count stands at 6,000 men, a number which I endeavor to double in the months ahead. My namesakes and elders of Villardouane and Joinville, Eustace of Conflans, Renard of Montmiral, Renard of Dampier, Villain of Neuilly, Guy, our venerable constable who controls Bourbon and Montlucon, were amongst the first to take the cross. Their ranks are now joined by Walter of Fouligny, Guillaume of Joigny, Odo of Champly, Ralph of Suisson, and Walter of Vignory, whose retinue of 60 knights and 40 mounted sergeants I personally examined. Our aims, which we previously thought would be under the king's influence, is fully committed thanks to the oratory of its Archbishop White Hands. Walter of Chatillon, a veteran of many Altamont battles, who is now Seneschal of Burgundy, is among those who remain. His support would mean us a great deal. Unfortunately, the members of Grand Prix House have yet to respond to my letters, but I will continue to send them. That concludes my report, noble lords. In the span of our last parley, I have received missives from the following nobles who have voiced their desire to become Crucignati, 
Guy of Blazes, Henry of Azilez, Walter of Montbelliard, Olga of saint Chiron, Evan of Mondenay, Manasses of Lédaz, and the bishops of Anton and Forez. Together the bishops alone must muster a total of 300 knights, and are eager to lead them to the Holy Land. When we merge this strength with that of Montfort and Perch, we are beginning to resemble a real army, capable of reclaiming Jerusalem. That is very well said, sir. Amidst my studies of military manuals, I have sought to parlay with the Duke of Burgundy, Odo, and my cousin Theobald of Bar. Yet, such an endeavor may require a rendezvous in the flesh. If I falter, we still possess potent connections in their domains. My sister is wed to a prominent knight in Macon who could potentially sway William to our cause. I implore you to correspond with the bishops of Chalon and Langres. And Louis, consider a journey to Berry to negotiate with Andrew. A recent treaty has detached his counties of Isodun and Deu from the Angevins and he is unlikely to wish to be entangled in the turmoil of the looming war. Baldwin, your acquaintance with Peter of Courtenay is well known. If he aligns with us, we could also secure the allegiance of William of saint -Cré. Failing that, we may turn to their adversary, Hervé of Nevers. As for the Englishmen, not a single Angevin lord has made overtures to us. How might we rectify the situation? If I may, my lord, regrettably John and Eleanor seem disinclined to contribute even a squire. But despite the recent treaty, the Angevin lords are teetering on the precipice of conflict. The barons of Maine, Anjou, and Terrain have aligned with the Prince of Brittany, while Normandy and Eleanor's antiquated support John. The Nunguisians and the Angevins bear fangs at each other and Gaston of Ban is absorbed in forging his own realm in the southern reaches. I fear the outlook of their lands is, indeed, hopeless. Though my brother shall labor to sway lords in Normandy, it behooves us to seek recruits in the Empire of War Toulouse. Placing trust in Raymond's domain would be unwise. He changes his loyalties as frequently as he changes his wedding ring. His fifth and latest bride is some Greek princess whom Richard took as a trophy. While the Provencal may be... affluent, their avarice and ambitions could prove to be more of a burden than an asset. And what tidings of Outremer itself? Does any of you possess knowledge on the stance of the Poulains? Amory rules both Cyprus and the fragile kingdom of Jerusalem in Isabella's name, with the backing of the Iblins. We find some respite from the infidels as they struggle to find a successor to Salah ad-Din, though it is doubtful this shall last. And in the north, the counties of Tripoli and Antioch are in disarray, with their incessant squabbles over trade rights and minor castles. Could we not just harness the might for the Empire, perhaps even call upon the Italians? Innocent has wisely added, for though obedience to divine service should be voluntary, we read in the gospel that those invited to the Lord's wedding feast should be compelled to enter. We must craft a strategy, and with the cooperation of my fellow clergymen, we can win the hearts of all who yearn to listen. I believe that the best way this can be done is by promising special privileges to all Crucignati. Things such as ecclesiastical protection, delay of debt repayment, acquisition of interest-free loans, tax exemptions, Oh, and the liberty to freely sell and mortgage property. We must showcase sacred relics on mobile carriages. They must carry silk shrouds, exotic fruits in the very bones of our saints. Liturgies and hymns dedicated to Outremer must resonate within every abbey and choir. My lord is indeed correct. Songs are powerful and can sway the heart. Just imagine. Troubadours singing in every great hall and tavern. The folk will listen to the gospel, but the gossip will occur at the campfires and mess halls, not just the church pews. Henceforth, my noble lords, die not alone. Extend the hand of hospitality to your priors and bannermen, granting them a place at your table.
With all due respect, my lady, songs may sustain this expedition for a week, but if we want to go any longer, we need silver. Only that promise will comfort them when they may bear the burdens of arms, toil, and sweat under hail, rain, and searing sun. As for our vassals, they must be notified to reprimand their corrupt bailiffs and bishops, and sell their offices to capable men. Any knight seeking exemption from this quest must pay a substantial tithe. We shall reach a point when coins grow scarce, so bring any luxury items and finery you may procure, for the Lombard markets will readily absorb them. Moreover, let us impose taxes on all movable wealth for those not embarking on this crusade, accepting jewels, arms, garments, and books. Guilds should be established, with donations collected by the Militus Christi. The Templars especially excel in such endeavors. Even the outlaws and transgressors can find purpose. So spread the word that this pilgrimage could serve as their penance. Bear in mind, men cannot take the cross without the consent of their wives. Therefore, direct your appeals toward them, regaling them with tales of delicious cuisine, enchanting fragrances and resplendent silk gowns. When Lisbon fell half a century ago, its defenders taunted many with stories of infidelity, claiming their wives at home were unfaithful and looting their estates. Silver may buy a man's loyalty for a time, but when he brings his affluent bride, they shall follow you through every breach. Uh, but, 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 my lords, it is also common knowledge that women hinder men's progress and distract them, so we must not bring along members of their sex unless they are wedded, or <laughs> reputable laundresses. With an ample well chest and resolute leadership, we can unite into a formidable force, already surpassing that of Philip's retinue in both mounted knights and sergeants. With no regal power rallying behind us, we must craft a clear charter that lays out proper conduct. My father's laws, which so greatly reduced crime in our lands, may provide a guide. We should appoint two conjurati for every thousand men, and dole out stern punishments. Assault shall mean loss of a hand, desertion a foot, and murderers shall be denied honorable burial, left to fester where they fall. Any man who deigns to violate market regulations or tamper with the scale shall forfeit his head. For gambling, prostitution, ostentatious attire, and blasphemy, fines and flogging shall suffice. Oh, that reminds me. Nevalon, my dear bishop, we would require pious clergy to lead prayer and administer sacraments before and after battle, as well as maintain records in between. They should be responsible for upholding order, composing letters, and overseeing wills. Can you see to their recruitment? With pride, my lord. I concur with these measures. However, as the chosen leader of this endeavor, I wish to make one point unmistakably clear. We must all find our ways to amass wealth, but none of it shall come at the expense of the Israelites. Though I apprehend that some may object, I stand steadfast in this determination. Now, let us address the matter of sustenance. Lord Thierry, Baldwin informs me of your proficiency with numbers. Firstly, when tallying our numbers, we must be mindful that each knight or sergeant ought to be accompanied by no less than an equal number of servientes for the preparation of bread and dry biscuits. It is of utmost import to bear in mind that hunger and maladies have filled more of our comrades than Saracen arrows. We shall necessitate a multitude of carriages laden with water, wine, flour, fruits and vegetables. Salted pork and fish, cheese and honey are essential, particularly for celebrating victories and the feasts of the saints. You must all be well aware that each day upon the road shall engender a multitude of expenses. A sum of no less than 100,000 marks is requisite for a campaign spanning a year, which exceeds thrice the annual revenues of France. While soldiers are obliged to provide their own armour, it falls upon their lieges to supply horseshoes, crossbow bolts and arrowheads. These seemingly trifling iron components accumulate swiftly. The services of skilled artisans shall be imperative, including blacksmiths to mend armour and shoe horses, engineers, architects, carpenters and masons. And of course, let us not omit the medicos. I have personally convened with learned physicians from both the Sorbonne 
and Montpellier, who have devised novel methods for treating wounds, including the extraction of pus, contrary to Gallen's teachings. Their proficiency in bandaging, cauterizing, bone setting, treponing, and arrow extraction may well preserve the life of some of us here today. Furthermore, several brethren of the Hospitalier order have pledged their allegiance to my retinue and shall assist us in the construction of hospitals and encampments when the need arises. Indeed, we must also prepare thousands of wineskins, pilgrims' bags and staves. Fortunately, Theobald has generously offered to procure these. Each man will require just over a kilo of provisions and between three and six litres of drink each day. Lastly, we have the ultimate strength of every pilgrim army, war horses. Ugh, ugh. all this talk of rations and horse piss. I beg your pardon, but who exactly are you? You forget yourself, boy. This here is Terry of Flanders, the grandson of a man who embarked on four armed pilgrimages, more than any other in history. Forgive the insolent intrusion, lad, please. Continue. The Saracens possess formidable fortifications, Greek fire, superior numbers, and an intimate knowledge of the land. However, for generations, our greatest strength, second only to our faith, has been our war steeds. They are larger, stronger, and more courageous, having broken numerous infidel lines. Yet this strength comes at a cost. Each horse requires at least two attendants, vast pastures, and a daily ration of five kilos of grain, five of hay, and 32 litres of water. This simple truth is the very reason why Barbarossa and his mighty host opted for the land route. Sea voyages are protracted, during which these noble beasts wither away and produce copious amounts of sickening waste. In Flanders, we have explored various ship designs to surmount this challenge, but the Italians, those from the republics, have long since devised a solution. Philip himself managed to transport 1,300 horses successfully to the walls of Acre, thanks to the Genoans. Should our prayers be answered and our prognostications hold true, we shall be tasked with caring for over 4,000 steeds. There can be no dispute on the matter. We must enlist the services of the Italians and set sail for Ultrema. The Marsilians lack the requisite capabilities for the scale of our expedition, but... Lunacy! <laughs> you propose gathering a host of thousands and crossing the Alps? Oh, listen, lad, I've made that journey myself. We would surely lose half of our men before we set foot in a port! My lord, rest assured, the journey shall not be as perilous as you imagine. Engaging one transport for Massey and another from Lambal is not only unjustified, but would leave us impoverished by the time we reach the Holy Land. What if we were to embark without our steeds? Our primary aim is the successful siege of Jerusalem, Ah, so what do we have need for war horses there anyway? Now that, my friends, is lunacy. You have my support, Lord Theory. Speak forthwith. My noble lords, we cannot reclaim Jerusalem so distant from the coast without first defeating our adversaries. As Richard and those before us have shown, this shall not occur in the Promised Land. Minor skirmishes have already been waged and triumphed by men such as yourself, Lord Perch, and Richard spoke true when he declared that the key to the kingdom lies in Egyptus. <laughs> you would have a strike in Egypt. My lord. Let the boy speak. My lord. My lord. My lord. There is no need for such cacophony. Let us speak like civilized people. <coughs> If you can't stand this cacophony, then go ahead and weave with the rest of the maidens. Careful how you speak, Plantagenet bootlicker. What kind of sounds you are doing? Heed my word. Once we return from our victory, it shall be only a matter of time before the Pope calls for another crusade. Is it not our mission to safeguard God's holy mountain rather than simply climb it? 
to kill a snake, you simply chop off its head. Le garçon bâtard is right. We must endeavor to accomplish that which none of our forebears have ever even dreamed of. Yet, once the knights learn we're bound for Babylon instead of Jerusalem, <laughs> well, they may as well forsake our cause. Hence, we shall not divulge it to them. We, as the ordained leaders of our community, bear the responsibility of making these difficult determinations. Behold, this detailed map crafted for the Sicilian king. We must embark upon the maritime path, you see, and I have already conducted the calculations. A standard pilgrimage from Marseille to Judea takes 35 days, passing through Sicily, Crete, Cyprus, and then mere days later, we shall reach the Nile. With a host such as ours, no Arab fleet will withstand us. Yet, be aware that our challenge is not solely logistical. We must stand united, both marching and sailing as one, departing from but a single port. I may have a suggestion, sir. Shall no! We? You chose me as your leader. Now, let me attempt to give us all some clarity. Theory here believes that Marseille lacks the capacity to transport our steeds. Genoa lies under the influence of Philip. And Pisa's allegiance to the Empire, as we all know, is unwavering. As for Messina, or other far-fetched dreams, they're situated too far to the south, my lords. No, all roads lead to one destination. The cost will be considerable. But for a sufficient payment, Venice has the potential to bring our dreams to fruition. They shall not only construct our fleet, but also ensure our forces are amply supplied. With your blessing, we can dispatch envoys to negotiate a treaty, and come the next Easter, we shall set sail, leading over 20,000 Christians. Once the bountiful Nile is secured, Jerusalem and all that was taken by Salah din shall promptly fall into our grasp. Novel counties and duchies shall be forged in the crucible of glory, and the generations of Christians to come shall owe their safe pilgrimages to our endeavors. Gentlemen, Crucignati, friends, behold, we find ourselves on the precipice of glory, where valor and destiny entwine like the ivy on the castle wall. Louis, my steadfast champion, all our childhood we dreamt of charging into the breach. Sail with me now, and we shall seize that moment, brother. Joffrey, noble lord of Perch. You watched your father succumb to malady before he even had a glimpse of the holy city. You are duty bound to avenge him, not repeat his mistakes. The same fire burns in all of our hearts, but it will be for naught if it burns out along the way. Perhaps somewhere between the rugged trails of Hungary and Constantinople, long before us, Alexander Magnus strode this earth carving his legend upon the annals of history and erected that great port city in his name. For centuries, it stood as a bastion of faith where Saint Athanasius, Cyril, and Didymus the Blind were born. We invoke their names today and venerate their relics, not because they chose the easy path, but because they dared to do what others only pray for. We are all equals here, so I call for a council vote and will abide by its decision. Just know that this opportunity should not be squandered. Those books you read are mostly filled with nonsense, cousin. But the valor and the originality of your plan, it inspires me. Me and my hammer, we will hold the line, even if dragons and demons come in our way. We 
Scores of Christians await liberation while Egyptus detains nothing but heretical Copts. I vote no. Just as the lands of Jerusalem came nigh to be lost after the conquest, Godfrey of Bouillon was elected king, and the Count of Toulouse became so fulfilled with envy that he enticed the other barons to abandon the host, so we will commit to infighting as soon as Alexandria falls. No. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. What was once a thriving epicenter of Christian faith shall be once more. We. Oui. I can alleviate our burden by sending my fleet around to the Pillars of Hercules, bearing much of our metal. The Venetians have demonstrated their prowess as mariners, and I can see this plan through. Though I am uncertain of what we will find in Egyptus, I stand united with thee, Terrible. We. Oui. The new vision for the Crusade was swiftly embraced by the Council and a treaty was promptly drafted and sealed. Each of the three prominent lords appointed a pair of envoys, and the group was to be led by Joffrey personally. In unison, they would journey to the court of the Venetian Doge, Enrico Dondolo, to present him with a daring proposal, the liberation of Jerusalem through the conquest of Egypt. This audacious plan aimed to surpass the limits of medieval logistics, and with Venetian support, Theobald aspired to strike at the very heart of Ayyubid power.